Scripture Mike has chosen uh, for his message today is Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Good morning, everyone. Let me tell you, when technology breaks, it breaks hard. <clears throat> um, but you know what? It's OK, uh, because you know, if worse came to it, you wouldn't get a slideshow, but then you'd miss my delightful slides, and we can't have that. Um, hopefully, everyone's having a great day. Uh, yesterday was a great day to help the MUMAs move. It was really a good, uh, a good teamwork effort between those people that were there. I'm a little tender today. Um, you know, moving is a tiring task, but it's always better when it's not raining outside and the weather was fantastic. So I was really glad to be able to do, uh, do that. And uh, they have a beautiful house. Um, so, Like sand through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Now, I'm not going to be talking about soap operas. I know, you're all just, whew, good, great. He's not talking about soap operas. Uh, I, I think, though, this statement, this intro to this iconic, I think, NBC uh, soap opera, I clearly don't watch soap operas, um, is very fitting because in, 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 in the sense that time passes through the hourglass, right? And no matter what you do, time is always going to move on and time is always existence is always going to move on until uh, the hourglass ceases to exist uh, but have you ever felt this way uh, I'm sure you have um, you kind of ask yourself oh where did the time go where, where did the day go it was so busy where did the day go where did the week go or you check your watch and go oh it's the 21st of May where did the month of May go it's already more than halfway through that month. Um, and, and, and then there's this saying, right? Time flies when you're having fun, uh, but we all know what happens when you know, the, the antithesis occurs and you're bored. And, and I know that you've experienced this because all of us went through school. And in May and June, right, when you're in school and it's nice outside, and you hear the birds chirping, mocking you as you sit in your classroom having to learn things. And they always, you notice they always save the boring stuff for like later after lunch, like, um, you know, accounting. Um, so, no offense to the accountants. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they put it right after you eat so you're full and it's warm and they're talking and then you're just, you know, you're asleep. Uh, but you're watching the clock, and it's moving at a glacial pace, right? Just so slow. You just ask yourself, is this clock broken? And then it moves, and you're like, oh, no, it's not. But so there's those two things, right? There's time flies when you're having fun, and then when you're bored, it just stands still. How we spend our time tells a lot about who we are. And we talked about this concept a few weeks ago when we were talking about unity in the church, and unity in the body and our spiritual gifts, right? Um, we're going to explore this a little more today. We are expressive people. You just think about, oh, well, I'm not expressive. Okay, you have body language. You express yourself, okay? How we talk, and that's one of the big flaws about texting, is until they invented emo uh, emojis, um, you know, there was no such thing as emotion with your text messages. There was just lol, um, you know. But you didn't know if that was a sarcastic laugh or a not sarcastic. So we have these now face bubbles that can add emotion. Um, we have our causes. We have our beliefs. But I would like to say um, or make this argument that how we spend our time is going to show what's most important to us, okay? Matthew 21, 28 through 31 says, 
what do you think? A man had two sons, and, if he, uh, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. And he went to the, second, uh, to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I, uh, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of these did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Okay? I say all this because obviously God wants us to tell the truth, right? I'm not condoning lying to your father, okay? It's probably not a good thing to do. Um, but he also desires our actions to be righteous. So in the perfect world, both sons would say, yes, I'll do it, and then did it. But that's not how it works, okay? Um, and so he wants our actions to be, or our words and our actions to be backed up with righteousness. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you say that you believe in maintaining the environment uh, if you drive a Hummer. And as you see here, there's a, there's a Hummer with an Al Gore bumper sticker on it. I thought that was funny. Um, okay, uh, it doesn't matter if you say you're on a budget if you choose to spend money whenever and wherever you want. I want to be on your budget, if that's the case, okay? Um, it doesn't matter if you say, I like Syracuse football, because really, I mean, come on, do they really have a football team? I mean, let's just get real, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter if you say, <laughs> yeah, I know, stepped on some people's toes. Look, I want a winning record, all right? Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you stone the preacher because he made jokes that you didn't find were funny. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you say you're a Christian if you don't do anything to back up your claim. So, and this is important, right? By, uh, by no means am I saying um, that in order to go to heaven, you have to do things to earn your way. I'm not saying that, okay? Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while... We were still weak at the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. For one, will, uh, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his, uh, God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So God saw it fit to give us his son Jesus so that while we were still sinners, God made grace available for us to join into him. Hence, baptism into the body of Christ. But as we have discussed, if we are part of the body of Christ, we must have a function in the body of Christ. Because a body part that doesn't do anything is pointless. And we have to be able to communicate to others with our time, what our function is. So I find this interesting, all right? Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, the U.S. Department of Labor published a survey in 2016 um, of results um, of, and, and, and the survey took place in 2015, but they published it in 16, <clears throat> uh, results of how the average American spends their day. Okay, and maybe you can make this out if you can't. Uh, that's okay, because I'm going to highlight a few things. Um, but as you can see, our days are pretty busy, right? There's certainly a lot of numbers to represent men and women and the average of the total of both of them and all these figures and stuff like that, of how we spend our day, <clears throat> okay, In, into all these charts. And this whole survey took about 24 pages of findings. <clears throat> but I'm going to highlight a few of these. Okay, so sleeping, 8.83 hours, okay, of your day. The average American. Um, I, I don't get to sleep that much, but, you know, average American. Working, uh, 6.72 hours. Uh, this is the average American. Uh, leisure and sports, uh, 5.21. Okay, I'm going to pause right here, okay. Right here, I've already listed 20.2 seven, six hours of the typical American's day, okay? 
That's 20.76 hours. And, and that's before we do that thing that everyone enjoys doing, eating, okay? Eating is 1.18 hours. Then there's the, the, the thing that you have to do after you're done eating, housework, okay? Because eating involves dirtying dishes, okay? Um, so house, household work would include food preparation, cleaning, lawn care, etc. That's 1.84 hours, okay? So right there, okay, just in those things, you've got 23.78 hours of your 24-hour day, okay? Average American. Religion. Hold on, go back. Point one five. So that's 23 hours and 90, well, 20, 23.93 hours of your day. Religion, point one five. How do you add up? I'll be honest with you. I'm a little more average than I'd like to admit. Um, and, and that's coming from a full-time minister. Okay? And, and I make this point only to say that not everything I do in ministry is spiritually nutritious to me. I'll give you an example. I don't care about fitting in in high school. Okay? Now, I spend a lot of time thinking about those things because I work with teenagers. But it doesn't matter to me if I fit in in high school because I don't go to high school. Uh, that, that, that part of my life has moved, you know, it, when I walk through the schools to go to Christian Students of Liverpool, I'm not wondering if I'm fitting in with the popular kids. Okay? It's just not something that I'm doing. Okay? Um, so I braise this I, 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 and use myself as an, ex as an example because I need to work on my time management skills in order to improve on my total amount of religious focus during the day, okay? Because 0.15 is a pretty small amount of minutes in your overall day, okay? Uh, we chase after the American dream not realizing that the American dream is fool's gold. Or we go along with the crowd because everyone else is doing it. So if you have ever asked yourself, where does the time go? Well, here's your answer if you're an average American. That's where the time goes. Uh, and maybe you've picked up on the problem at this point. Uh, if, you, if you haven't, or if you have, well, we're going to go ahead and examine a few scriptures. So John, 5, uh, John 15, 19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its, own, as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So, newsflash for you. We're not called to be average Americans. If the world does not hate you, it might be time to examine what you're doing, what you're investing your time in. Maybe it's time to examine your social commentary or your view about God's love versus what the world would like God's love to mean. Uh, the honest reality is that if you are a spiritual chameleon, you're just that. Blended fake hiding. The world hates Christ, not just the world, though. If you look in the context of what Jesus is talking about, the bad stuff that's about to happen to him doesn't necessarily, I mean, there's a crowd involved, but the Jewish leaders are the ones that are inciting this crowd to acting, right? The Jewish religious leaders, the guys that have the education on identifying the Messiah, hate the Messiah most. Why would the followers expect any different? How are you investing your time? John 17, 14 through 16 says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not 
of the world. See, Jesus reiterates this point that he makes in John 15, once again in John 17, which makes me think that he's trying to make a point. And his disciples hopefully caught on. Uh, Jesus asked Jesus asks God not to make the world love his followers, but to keep them from the evil one, identifying the real threat in this situation. Jesus is keeping things in perspective even before he goes to the cross. And you think about the situation, right? Um, He's about to be hated by the world in a pretty extreme way. Uh, It it would have been pretty easy for him to ask not to be hated by the world. That would have skipped the whole cross episode. I think that uh, we often forget about Satan being the prowling lion because we live in the world and don't like to be persecuted because that's not fun and enjoyable. You need to also be aware, though, that Jesus is saying that the world is going to hate his followers, but Jesus is not saying that we are supposed to hate the world. Now, that doesn't mean that you go, you know, go out and get all these bad habits um, so that you can love the world and the world will love you and you can all identify with each other. Uh, But it does mean that we need to be able to interact with the world so that we can fulfill the Great Commission. So how are you investing your time? Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So Paul adds to this perspective by encouraging us to be of a transformed mind, separate and apart from the world. If Paul got a hold of this 2016 census, he'd be asking us, how are ours look different than the average American? <clears throat> so we need to figure out what is good and acceptable and perfect in our situation, our living situation. So maybe that means that you have dinner as a family. I know, crazy, right? Without the TV on and with no cell phones at the table. I know, now I'm just being, you know, completely unreasonable. Maybe it means volunteering at the food pantry or the clothing closet instead of binge watching that show on Netflix. Maybe it's even setting aside your desires for the, better, the betterment of a ministry that you're already involved in. Regardless of your life situation, you have a purpose, and God intends on using you to fulfill it. Jesus needs you. And I don't know if God works in your life the same way that he works in mine, uh, but, but I find that I continually face the same life situation until I figure out that I need to rely on God in order to get through the situation. History is doomed to repeat itself if you don't learn from it. And that's very true in my life. So how are you investing your time? Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created as the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul is once again calling us to dwell on righteous and holy uh, holiness opposed to what the old self might have dwelt on. Uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we're creature of habit, or creatures of habit. I think that's you know one of the reasons why it's so easy for Satan to tempt us because he just uses our habits against us. Okay. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, 
when we're baptized, there is no great habitual reset that occurs. We are new creatures with old habits. And habits aren't always easily broken. <clears throat> but if we are really going to make efforts to be new creatures in Christ, then we need to make conscious effort to understand us and where those habits come up and how to work through them. So how are you investing your time? Financially, smart investing means that you don't have any idle money. Idle money isn't doing anything for you. It's not working for you and therefore cannot grow and cannot gain value. That principle can also be applied to how you invest your time in your life. <clears throat> As a person of the world, your life goal, one, someone's life goal in the world could be a number of things, okay? Some of them good, some of them bad. Just an example, okay? Money, career, family, fame, retirement, any of these things could be anyone's life goal that you meet on the street on any given day, okay? All of these could be an end game. In the life of a Christian, the end game is heaven, but not just heaven, okay? And here's the cool thing about Christianity. Heaven is going to be great, but it's going to be great because we're in a relationship with God and we're going to be in the same presence of God. That's what's going to make heaven great. Okay? And the good news here is that you can be in a relationship with God now. You don't have to wait until heaven. Being in a relationship with God is the greatest thing you can experience. You know why heaven is going to be great? It's going to be because of that relationship that you already have had and established with God. I've used this example at camp before. Um, if you've been to camp and you've seen the teaching shelters, you go, okay, that's similar. Camp hunt teaching shelters don't come up on Google Images. So we've got to take pictures of it and post them somewhere so that they'll come up on Google Images So for when I need this example. But if I, I've used this example before. If heaven was the camp hunt teaching shelter, it would still be the greatest thing you will have ever experienced because you would be in the presence of God and in a relationship with him. The location, the size, doesn't matter, okay? What matters is the relationship with God and being in his presence. So, how are you investing your time? The average American spends 0.15 hours of their day in religious activity. But be more than average. Christ calls us to be transformed new creatures, not of this world, but of the heavenly realm. So how can you apply Christ to the rest of your 23.85 hours of your day? Why not ask God to show you and see all the opportunities that he gives you to further 